let's start with the component that we might expect that Cisco is going to do the best job of, which is the network integration. Cisco has long been a networking company and they didn't always make servers. They started making servers back in about 2009, 2010. And so we would expect that if they're going to tackle a server product, that they would do some really cool network integration. Let's just go to get this conversation out of the way. Yes, we can all assume that Cisco did a good job with the networking, but let's make sure we understand what exactly they did to do such a good job with it. Let's take a look. To best understand what exactly Cisco did to improve networking to servers, it's great to take a look at how servers traditionally connected to the network. And first of all, we need to understand that servers tend to come in two different forms. They either come in a rack mount form factor or they come as a blade. Now rack server is probably what we think of when we think of servers. If I've got the network up here, some kind of switching infrastructure, if I were to deploy a rack mount server, it would slide into the rack I'd mount it in there and then I would cable it up to the network. However, in a modern data center, rack servers can have maybe four, six, eight, even 10 or 12 I've seen connections to the network. And there are good reasons for that. We're not going to go into here in the moment, but at the same time, just recognize that a single rack server can have a lot of connections. And so if I deploy a rack server below it, well, you can imagine we're going to need all of those same connections going up to the network and for the rack server below that. And so a rack can hold up to 42 rack units worth of equipment. If each one of these rack servers is one or even maybe two rack units, and we can fit a whole lot of servers in one rack, and that's a whole lot of cabling mess that we have to deal with. Furthermore, if we were to draw this out physically, let's say we have a couple of racks right next to each other, and we deploy some rack servers in here, we deploy some rack servers in here, we have to decide how many top of rack switches we're going to have in our environment. This is always a debate because if I have one top of rack switch up here and one top of rack switch over here, uh, that's going to cause some amount of grief because I'm going to have to cable to both sides, which means my cables, even though I can logically draw it out like that, realistically, my cables are going to have to go up into the tray, over and then down, or possibly uh, down into the floor and over if we're using a raised floor. And so we might say, well, okay, for redundancy's sake, yes, we need two switches, so let's just put two switches into each rack. Well, the problem with that is, number one, it's more expensive, but number two, I have to manage twice as many top of rack switches. And so this is where Cisco's Nexus 2Ks come into play. We love the Nexus 2Ks because we don't have to manage them as much. But ultimately, even with that consideration in mind, we might only have a single top of rack switch per rack, which means that we're going to end up with this kind of cabling nightmare. So what's up with these blade servers? Well, if we've lived in the networking world for most of our career, then we might not be fully aware of what a blade server is. And here's the idea, though. We can relate it back to something like Cisco's 4500 or 6500 switches. Or hey, if you've deployed the new Nexus 9Ks, we'd be talking about 9400s. But either way, we understand what a chassis switch looks like because we've got this empty shell of a chassis and then we are going to deploy network functionality into it. So I deploy a blade that has a bunch of network ports. Maybe these are RJ45s. And then I deploy another blade into here and this one has different functionality. It's got SFP slots, maybe at 40 gig or something along those lines. And so I understand that I can take this chassis and I can populate it with functionality. And until I populate it with that functionality, there's really not a whole lot going on in there. Well, this blade server concept is identical to this. We're going to take a chassis and we're going to start to mount blades in there. Now, some vendors make it so you mount them horizontally, some make it so you mount it vertically. I'll just draw this out vertically here in this case. So I'm going to insert a server. And this is truly a fully functional server. It's got everything it needs uh, to basically form what is a server, a computer, right? With CPU and memory and uh, maybe hard disk drives and everything like that all in a small form factor. And so we can fit a lot of these blade servers in a single chassis. A lot of times it's eight, sometimes it's even up to 16. Just depends once again on the model and the vendor. But ultimately we're gaining the modularity as well as the power and cooling efficiency and even the space conservation. All of the benefits that we get out of a chassis switch are now being applied to the server space. Now the difference though is that we still need to worry about the network itself. I mean, we are providing the network with a network switch, but we're not doing that with a bunch of blade servers. So how do these blade servers communicate with the network? Well, if we spin this chassis around on the back, we're going to find that we've got a couple of things. First of all, we might actually have a pair of network switches. And these switches are fully functional switches, meaning I'm gonna bring redundant connections in through the network, which means I'm gonna to have to run spanning tree here and block a port, and maybe on this switch as well. And we understand that these servers here have internal traces connecting to these switches. And so we have redundant connections from each server to each switch, and we've got redundant connections upstream. 
And one of the problems that can come up here is that me as the network admin, I'm the one managing the top of rack switches and deploying the configurations, but who manages these switches? Especially if they're not Cisco switches. Now, as a partial solution here, Cisco does actually make switches that insert into different vendors' chassis. And that's really cool when we deploy a Cisco switch in there because we've got CLI access in there. We can do all of our typical configurations and it brings these switches back into the networking team's realm. But if they're not Cisco switches, who's gonna manage these? Is the networking team going to take responsibility or is the server team going to take responsibility? And if it's the server team, how do we ensure that the proper policies are getting deployed down into the server space? To make matters worse, by the way, we actually might have to install fiber channel switches in here as well if we're using fiber channel for storage. And so we have the same question, who's managing those? And who's, is it the same people who manage our Cisco MDS switches for fiber channel? And so we might actually end up having dozens of these chassis in our environment, which is going to result in a lot of switches that may or may not be managed by the appropriate parties. And so we've got a mess no matter how we go about doing this, whether we deploy on rack servers or blade servers, either way, we have major pain points that we need to address. So as you can imagine, Cisco decided when they were going to design UCS to solve a lot of these problems as best they could. And they arguably were the best equipped to do so because they are coming from a networking perspective. Their solution is going to revolve around what we call fabric interconnects. These fabric interconnects are going to look and feel a whole lot like Nexus switches. In fact, they are equivalently the architecture of a Nexus switch. However, they also add some specialized ASICs in here for the UCS environment. And so yes, they are running NXOS code. However, they're also running UCS code. And so it's a curious mix of technology in here, but ultimately, if you were to look at one of these, you would recognize it as possibly being a ne Nexus switch, just painted blue instead of silver. Now we are going to deploy two of these for redundancy and we're going to connect them up to the local area network, just like we did before with these individual servers. Now these fabric interconnects, even though they're Nexus switches, they're not capable of doing virtual port channels upstream. Certainly we could receive a virtual port channel just like any other device could. However, in this case, we're probably just going to bundle these two connections together up to the local area network. Now UCS has always been an endless bucket of bandwidth because these fabric interconnects are non-blocking. We can switch all of our traffic at line rate just like a Nexus switch can. And our line rate is actually at 10 gig and 40 gig and even up to 100 gig. And so we've got truly as much bandwidth as we need in this environment. We're never going to run out or have bottlenecks like we could have ended up with with the traditional solution. Now you're saying, okay, Jeff, this is cool, but weren't we going to talk about servers here? <laughs> and yes, all of the servers are going to be downstream of the fabric interconnects. That's the whole point of them. We're sitting in the middle between the network up here and the server domain. And so as we connect servers up here to the fabric interconnects, so long as we have enough ports on the fabric interconnects, and usually that's not a big concern for us, well, we don't need to worry about adding additional connections up here at the network level. And it doesn't matter whether these are rack mount servers or blades, or even by the way, storage servers, hyperconvergence, anything like that. We'll say hyperconverged infrastructure down here. We've got all kinds of options for server types downstream of the fabric interconnects. And the point is whatever's happening down here is irrelevant to the network. And the secret to why the network doesn't care about what's happening down here is the fact that we are running these fabric interconnects in something that we call end host mode. End host mode means that we're not actually running these devices as switches. And you say, well, wait a second, we said that they were like Nexus architecture, so what's going on here? Well, instead of running them as switches, we're effectively running them as if they are the NICs for the downstream servers, meaning that we're not running switching protocols. We don't have to run spanning tree protocol. This is a thing of beauty. And all of these uplinks are active active. The reason we can do that is because once again, we're running as if we are an end host. A server can certainly have active active connections up to the network. So why can't we if we're running in end host mode? Now we're going to be going into a lot of detail of what end host mode means later on, but for now, just essentially think of these fabric interconnects as if they are NICs for the downstream servers. We're virtualizing all of these connections upstream, which makes it so that as far as the network is concerned, we really only have a handful of connections down into the server environment. In fact, the network's never really going to see a networking event occur even if we're connecting and disconnecting servers. To the point that even if we need more bandwidth in our environment, we can simply add connections into these port channels in order to make it so that, well, we've got more bandwidth and because their port channels, a single logical connection doesn't care about how many physical connections there are, as long as we can continue to add uh, connections. And by the way, these could be cheap twin X connectors. As long as we continue to add physical connections into existing logical port channels, the network is never going to think an event has occurred. 
Now, the last point here is what about those chassis that we talked about? I mean, we just mentioned that Cisco supports Blade servers, so how are we going to handle this chassis crisis? Because we're going to have the same problem with UCS in that we've got a chassis. Cisco's chassis looks like this. We mount the blades horizontally, and we've got a divider down the middle, so we can have up to eight of what we call half-width slots, or we can have, well, let's see here, eight of those, or we could have four of the full-width slots. So we could actually mount a server in here. Anyways, that's a little distraction. The point is that the chassis, if we flip this around once again, is going to have to have some kind of network connectivity. And so yes, if I can squeeze it in here, we are going to have a couple of what we might call network switches. However, these are actually fabric extenders. We spent quite a bit of time talking about FEXs earlier in this course, Nexus 2Ks and how we don't have to manage them. I just mentioned it earlier on in this video, in fact. And so by deploying fabric extender technology into the chassis and allowing the fabric interconnects to be the parent switch, well, hey, now we have the best of all worlds because we have connectivity downstream and we're not extending our management domain because of the fexes. Now, Cisco did decide that we shouldn't inject too many networky words into a server product. And so these fexes are actually known as IO modules or IOMs inside of the UCS space. But we in the networking world understand if I connect this fex up to this fabric interconnect and this fex up to this fabric interconnect that I haven't actually extended my management domain. So some of the key features of UCS here, as we see, we're going to cable to the network once, we could call that a cable once technology, because no matter what we do with our servers, we only ever have to worry about connecting to the network one time. And yeah, we might enhance port channels and such, but as far as the network is concerned, we're never going to need to run network events like a spanning tree, topology change notifications, those kinds of things will never happen with UCS downstream. Now, end host mode is a big secret to that success because those of fabric interconnects are not running spanning tree, they're not running as switches, they're running as if they are the NICs, they're representing the server NICs downstream upstream to the network. And again, we're going to be going into more detail about what all is involved with that magic later on. Now, UCS is also going to eliminate this concept of management sprawl again, whether we had the rack mount servers in the traditional architecture with tons of top of rack switches or the blade uh, environments with all of the switches built into the blades. Either way, that is all done away with with UCS. Once again, we have the wire ones technology upstream and then we have the fabric extender technology downstream that is really making it so we don't have to worry about managing a bunch of nodes. I hope this has been informative for you. I'd like to thank you for viewing. Thanks for watching. Be sure to click here to subscribe to CBT Nuggets and click the notification bell to make sure that you're aware of every time we post new content. If you're interested in a career in IT or you want to brush up on your IT skills, then swing over to our website and while you're there, be sure to sign up for a free trial.